Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, learn a little bit more about you know, our approach to fine tuning and aligning LLMs at Snorkel. We're excited to share both research and product with you. Um, just for some context, my name is Marty. I'm on the product team here focused on our development workflows for uh, generative AI for our customers. So imagine an enterprise data scientist looking to fine tune or align their own LLMs, retrieval systems, and the development workflows they would use in our product Snorkel to support that. So I'll start with a, a general overview of LLM systems or generative AI systems as our, our clients are, are largely building them and how we see them. We'll talk about the um, development approach that we are encoding into our product Snorkel Flow, and then we'll actually show parts of this live to you. So I'll start with a very simplified view of how our customers are building generative AI systems, whether they be co-pilots, chatbots, document Q&A systems. Uh, there's a large amount of uh, you know, private, unstructured data that is getting chunked and put into some sort of vector database um, with, with some sort of embedding representation. And then when users are asking questions uh, or are asking the system to complete an instruction, the retrieve context is sort of pulled into the prompt along with the instruction and a large language model generates the response. Now, before we even get into thinking about evaluation and development, we found that anchoring on two different components in this system um, makes development a lot more sort of intuitive and, and easy to kind of understand where you need to go. We bucket our our evaluation into retrieval and generation. So or an example of a retrieval you know, error would be that if I'm asking an instruction and I notice that the retrieve context doesn't actually contain the information that, the, that I would need to properly answer the question, that's a retrieval error. Whereas a generation error is, uh, hey, I'm looking at the retrieve context, it looks like it's correct. However, the generated response from the large language model is not adhering to my organization's preferences, objectives, or policies. And so the focus of today's demo will be on um, identifying and solving generation errors for your generative AI projects. If you go to our blog, you'll also find a couple of weeks back, we did a similar webinar focused on development workflows to address retrieval-based errors. So um, both of these are, are getting built into our product snorkel flow, but again, today we'll focus on generation. When we dig into approaches to solve generation errors, Tom talked about uh, many of these techniques as well as some that aren't even listed here. But the thing that I wanna highlight is that whether we're conducting supervised fine tuning or alignment via RLHF or DPO, human feedback today is what drives these uh, techniques and drives this progress and capabilities, this progress in, in safety that you're seeing from some of these, um, these labs. And what we found is when we try and take this and apply it to, when our customers try and take these techniques and apply them on their own, this manual approach does not scale. Our mission at Snorkel is to make these manual data development approaches look a lot more like software development. So you'll hear me use the word programmatic a lot. We're trying to take those things that we're doing manually in this process and, and make them programmatic. So how do we align a large language model programmatically in Snorkel? Well, we'll start by evaluating an existing generative AI system. We'll assess it for production quality. If it falls below our production quality benchmarks, We'll analyze the solution for gaps in performance. We'll actually spend most of our time focusing on the data um, that's being passed to this model in service of training, fine tuning, prompting, or retrieval. We'll then conduct actual fine tuning, which you'll see in the product VR integrations. And we'll, we'll onboard the newly fine tuned large language model into Snorkel, regenerate responses, and evaluate this. We strongly believe that this development process needs to be iterative. Um, and so you'll hopefully get some intuition behind the iterative loop that we're building inside of our product here, because we keep going through this loop until we've met our production quality benchmarks. And then we're, we're, we're confident that we can deploy this co-pilot, this chatbot uh, for our customers uh, with a high level of, of confidence and accuracy. So for our demo today, we are working at Acme Credit Services, and we're building a co-pilot for our customer service agents called Jarvis. And Jarvis is designed to sit right alongside our customer service agents. And for a given question from a user about their credit score or filing disputes or their credit report, be able to generate a factual, grounded, 
helpful response to the user. And uh, Acme Credit Services, we estimate that this will um, double the efficiency of our CSAs and save us over $25 million a year. This is very similar to a customer use case that we uh, recently completed over the last couple of months. So excited to dig into this use case a little bit more. We'll start by going into our pre-production environment where we're noticing some odd behavior from the current version of Jarvis. So maybe I'll start as a domain expert, maybe asked to do some testing here. Maybe I'll ask, um, how is my credit score calculated? And we're just, we, we just stood up a simple streamlit app. Uh, this is not snorkel flow just to give some intuition behind maybe the, uh, performance of this co-pilot in production or pre-production environment. So as a domain expert, I'm looking at this response and it's pretty good. It's giving, it's maybe a little bit more verbose than I would want, but it's giving me, um, you know, correct percentages here for calculation of FICO scores. But maybe if I ask something a little bit more specific, let's say um, I have some weird clothing charges on my credit report, how can I dispute? Uh, and as we're looking at this response, we start to see some problems. Um, so first off, uh, we see what looks to be a hallucination, uh, the large language model talking about stock purchases, when in reality, I asked about clothing charges. Um, there's a recommendation here to contact the SEC and file a police report, which uh, as a domain expert, uh, you know, putting my hat on, I know that this isn't something that you should actually be doing. And there's a very prescribed set of steps uh, that you would do inside of Acme's website to actually solve this problem. So we know we have a problem, but we need to get a little bit more of a comprehensive review of our instructions and the various responses from the Jarvis Copilot to understand how much of a problem we actually have. So we'll start by manually annotating um, examples of instructions, responses, and retrieve context in Snorkel Flow. So now we're in our flagship product uh, snorkel flow, and we are logged in as a domain expert, and we're looking at a, a various uh, prompt, the prompt prefix, or the often called the system prompt, a large language model's response, and then the retrieved context objects that are coming from our RAG pipeline. So you can think of snorkel as the place where you're going to develop artifacts that will improve your production solution, not the place necessarily where you're hosting that production solution. Um, so as a domain expert, I can uh, look on, on the right-hand side, you'll see all the different label schemas that I can label in this particular use case. So I can I have a single label schema for each piece of retrieve context. And for the sake of this example, I've just created a simple thumbs up, thumbs down for each piece of retrieve context in the overall large language model response. However, you could imagine um, creating uh, any sort of label schema that you would want you know, multi-dimensional, one to five, uh, free text label schema to be able to actually provide the right uh, degree of structured and unstructured feedback as your use case demands. So maybe I come in and I label the large language model response, and then I look at the various retrieve contexts and I label them. And I go through this process for a representative subset of documents. Maybe it's 50 to 75 documents just to get a sense of how well our system is performing. Meanwhile, uh, while I'm going through these documents as a domain expert, I can tag um, you know, sections of the document that may be interesting. So for example, if there's like a table of contents, oftentimes what we find is like with retrieval systems, perhaps like a table of contents is often retrieved. That's not very helpful, right? That can go in service of tuning our RAG system. Um, but I, I can also do things like adding comments. So I can say, this isn't, a realistic question, something like that. We feel very strongly at Snorkel that to build successful, whether it's generative or predictive or any type of, of ML or AI initiative in the enterprise, there needs to be a single platform where the domain experts and the data scientists or machine learning engineers can collaborate um, because the, the input from those domain experts is critical to actually tuning and training these, these systems. All right, so maybe I've done a little bit of baselining with uh, some manual labels. Where do I go next? As we mentioned at Snorkel, 
we one of the unique things with with generative use cases is that the manual labels collected by domain experts, whether they're quality labels, one to five rankings, um, they are uh, effectively thrown out with each iteration of fine tuning. Um, so they're they're sparse, and as you're fine tuning an LLM, you effectively lose the quality labels that you had collected before because there are new responses that are generated. So why don't we encode the definition of good versus bad? into an actual model inside of Snorkel. Uh, and so what we'll do next is we're actually going to build what we call a quality model inside of Snorkel. And very simply, a quality model can be thought of as something that can look at an instruction context response triple and basically give a ranking uh, or a, a you know an accept reject in the simplest form and some degree of confidence in that prediction. Now, how do we actually build this quality model? Well, we take the same logical thought processes that a domain expert is going through when they're evaluating a single response for good and bad, and we, we encode those into what we call labeling functions. Labeling functions can be thought of as heuristics that are used, whether keyword-based, regular expression, dictionaries, prompts to large language models, embeddings, any source of positive signal that can be used to label unlabeled data in service of training a model. So we'll build this quality model. We'll build it far faster than we would manually because we're able to write these labeling functions. And then we'll use this quality model in a couple, couple different ways. So first off, you could imagine taking the subset of predictions from the quality model where it's most confident in a, uh, a good instruction context response triple and using that as a data set for SFT or instruction fine tuning. Moreover, you could imagine pairing up good and bad responses for uh, a variant of DPO, as Tom had discussed, or any of the other sort of KTO or ORPO strategies um, would also benefit from being able to use this, um, this model's predictions. Not only do you use the, the model in service of finding a good data set for fine tuning, you can also use it for evaluation. Because as I mentioned before, after you've fine-tuned, you're going to now regenerate responses over your instruction set. And so you need to go, you know, in a manual world, you need to go to your domain experts and go collect new labels. But what the quality model affords you is a proxy for directional improvement in your, in your development workflow um, automatically. Because we can now just run that quality model over your new instruction context response pair triples and give you a directional signal as to whether you're moving up or down. So let's actually go into Snorkel and build this quality model. So now we're putting on our data scientist hat, and we're inside of Snorkel, and we're building a quality model. And as I mentioned, the primary building block for this quality model is labeling functions. So a couple of examples that I'll highlight in service of training this quality model would be, uh, let's start by, why don't we prompt a large language model um, to help us directionally label uh, a large portion of our data? So for example, I know that the Jarvis Copilot should be responding in numbered or bolded lists. That's a really good source of positive signal. So we should include that as a, as a labeling function. However, on the flip side, um, maybe... Uh, let me hop over here. Maybe if my um, maybe if my responses from my large language model contain the word last update um, or something that I know is very common from like a you know a parroting large language model that's coming from training on GPT-4 outputs, that's actually not a phrase that I want to include. Uh, so that would be a sign that you know this this uh, this isn't a good response, right? So you can imagine collecting these signals that are coming from your domain experts and actually writing those as labeling functions. You write seven, eight, nine labeling functions and inside of Snorkel, you can actually train one of these quality models. And so for the sake of simplicity, I chained on a very simple architecture here using logistic regression, um, but you could imagine increasing the complexity vector. We're actively improving the architectures made available for quality model training inside of our platform. But now we have a model that can kind of steer the outputs of our large language model. And this is a technique that the leading sort of model providers are using. We know this from sort of the research that they're putting out, but what we wanna make available to our customers is the actual development workflow that allows them to train and, and adapt these quality models on their own in service of these same initiatives. 
So now that we have a quality model, we can look at an evaluation of our total, all of our data um, and the acceptance rate. So basically the percentage of time that our responses are actually getting accepted as measured by ground truth and as measured by our quality model. And you can see that the predictions or the percentages or proportions are a little bit different here, but they're generally in the same uh, sort of ballpark. So we, we, we feel relatively confident that our quality model is doing a good job at predicting good and bad uh, sort of responses. So where do we go next? Well, the next step here is actually to curate a data set that can be used to fine tune a large language model. So to do this, we'll jump into a notebook. This is a Jupyter notebook that's attached to our snorkel flow instance. So everything I'm showing you in the UI is also uh, able to be achieved in the SDK. And some of the more advanced operations are actually only accessible there right now. But why don't we just take our quality model and use it to say, hey, if this model is highly confident in a good instruction context response, let's actually create a curated data set of these examples from our larger set of instruction context response pairs. What we can then do is we can actually go and take that data set and send it to a large language model for fine tuning. So in this example, I'm using our SDK and our integration with SageMaker Jumpstart to actually use this curated data to go out and fine tune the uh, Llama 3 8B instruct base model that was used as the V1 of this copilot that you saw in my earlier environment. And so if we were to go over and hop into our SageMaker instance, you'd see this actual job getting kicked off and the fine tuning occurring over there. So we kick off the fine tuning from Snorkel. And after the fine tuning is complete, Snorkel will automatically stand up the fine tuned model and generate new responses for our instructions. And so in this single loop, and it, it kind of depends on how long it'll take based off of you know, what model you're using to fine tune, what instances you're fine tuning, you'll be able to curate that data set, kick off a fine tuning job, go grab a cup of coffee, come back and have your new data automatically onboarded to Snorkel. So again, I'll just show you real quick. If I refresh this, we should see a training job in our Amazon SageMaker instance a fine tuning job that got kicked off here. Oh, awesome. Looks like we got two. So back to the demo. Now that we've have a fine tuned model, we can actually look at the performance of our first attempt, our base model, our V1, and the performance of our fine tuned model in a single evaluation pane inside of Snorkel. So now what you're looking at is across all your data, what is my ground truth acceptance rate, AKA the proportion of, of times is measured by a domain expert that I'm getting good responses. And what is the acceptance rate is measured by my quality model. And you'll notice that right now, we don't have any ground truth actually inside for our second iteration because we just fine tuned this model. But what we do get for free are these quality model metrics. So what I'm showing you here are like a couple metrics that come out of the box with Snorkel, but you could also go and register and create your own custom metrics here for that are important for your use case. But you can see that even this simple approach of creating a quality model, using that quality model's predictions to find the good data results in a 7.8% bump in overall acceptance rate. So let's press pause here for a second and just take stock of what we've done so far. So we noticed in our pre-production environment that we had some sort of failure modes, but we didn't exactly know how to fix them. So we onboarded data to Snorkel. We labeled that data to get a sense of how well we're performing as measured by our domain experts. We identified uh, some generation errors, and we built a quality model to help us scale this measurement of good versus bad. We use the quality model's predictions to create a high quality data set. We take that high quality data set and we fine tune our LLM. We bring those predictions back into Snorkel, and we can see an overall lift. So this is a great this is a great starting point. But what I want to propose is that to actually build robust generative AI in the enterprise, we need to take it one step further. We need to not only ensure that our solution is globally highly accurate, but it's also highly accurate across important data slices. Data slices are another programmatic operator that we are building inside of our product to round out a comprehensive way to evaluate LLM outputs. So while one axis of your evaluation is something like quality, you can imagine data slices help you 
identify the distribution of your data. So ensuring that you're, you're generating high quality outputs for each distribution of your data or the things that your solution is supposed to be good at answering. So in this example, maybe I write a slicing function, which is just a way in which you can identify a data slice for my disputes when people are asking about disputes as we saw in the, in the pre-prod environment. And we can see that even though my overall response accuracy is 75%, I'm actually performing really poorly when people are asking about disputes. And this not only helps me ensure that I'm building a solution that's good across all the categories I care about, but as a developer, I now can double click into my data slice on topics that are focused on disputes and do the following things. I can address bad dispute related responses. I could go fire this data off to a domain expert to say, hey, go write the gold standard response for how you're supposed to respond when people are asking about this type of dispute. Maybe I can actually upsample more good dispute examples in my curated data set. So that previous example I just showed you was just filtering based off the quality model, but you could imagine also using these data slices in service of creating a really high quality data mixture. We have some really interesting research from our affiliates uh, in this area as well, in a paper called Do Re Mi. And then lastly, maybe this is just an underrepresented slice and I need to go back to an LLM and generate new data for this data slice uh, so that I can generate more high quality responses either from an LLM or from a human. So how do we actually make data slices manifest in our, uh, in our product? When we think about writing data slices, you can again, think of them as labeling functions, but instead of it, a labeling function to determine good versus bad, this is sort of the distribution of our data. So I'll just call out a couple, uh, but you can imagine all the tools that I mentioned that are at your disposal for writing labeling functions are at your disposal for writing slicing functions. So prompts, embeddings, uh, heuristics like dictionaries or keywords, regular expressions. I could say like, hey, if this fast text model uh, predicts that this the, the language is Spanish, then we should put that data point in the is Spanish slice. Or um, maybe if I see the word password, email, or username in the in the instruction, um, then that's probably a user asking about an admin feature. Let's go register that data slice. And so now what we get when we combine this measurement of quality via the quality model and these data slices, we get a view into our data that looks something like this. So now we can both see that for a given iteration, we can see how well I'm doing across all of my data, but I can also see slice by slice, how well am I performing? For fear of making things a little too busy, I do wanna also show that we can not only show this slice wise comparison across for a given model iteration, but we can also show it between two different model iterations. So on your left-hand side, you're seeing our first version in our pre-prod environment that was having some issues with disputes. And on the right-hand side, you can see our fine-tuned model. And if we look at the dispute slice, it looks like we actually see a 4.3% bump as measured by the quality model uh, in, this, in this particular data slice. So we feel that at Snorkel, this, this is the view that you need as a developer to actually understand how well your model is performing across this various distribution of topics that it's supposed to be good at, at these various scenarios, and the ability to then double click into that data slice and go directly address the problems that you're seeing from the model. So we do this development, we build this quality model, we write these slicing functions, and then we redeploy a fine tuned LLM. And when we take that same question, let me go grab it. And we run it against our fine tuned LLM we can see that we're getting much better responses. So we're seeing a more detailed response. It's much more helpful. It's containing some of the information that we saw previously. Um, however, we're also seeing that it's it's definitely more specific to Acme Co. I know there's a lot of new techniques and topics that were covered there, but hopefully this gives you some intuition behind the programmatic approaches that we're bringing to fine tuning and aligning LLMs and Snorkel. Um, we are making this workflow uh, available in private beta very shortly uh, for our customers. So if you're interested in, in trying out this workflow, providing feedback to our team, we're very interested to hear from you, hear about your use cases, and uh, see if it's a good fit.